Uh, I now invite Professor Maynard, uh, Ron Professor Maynard from Houston, um, to talk about, he's a sociologist and anthropologist, so he's going to talk about the identity that Hindus have. So Professor Maynard, your question is, what is the truth about the identity that Hindus have evolved over the ages? And what are the efforts of alien groups to distort the identity of Hindus? After listening to such a brilliant um, presentation by our own author, uh, Sriman Holtra, um, I don't know how much more I can contribute to expanding your vision or thinking, because by now you must be well prepared to actually take off and go into an active mode. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not doing lip service. It is truly brilliant. It's a great book. Uh, let me say just um, a word or two about the book. Uh, I did read the book. Um, and while reading the book, I did come across uh, a number of discussions and references which I happen to be familiar with already. Um, therefore, I was able to actually increase the pace. It's such an intimidating volume. So, um, it's a great um, contribution to our understanding of ourselves. But perhaps um, what is the most creditable about this piece of work is that um, Sri Malhotra uh, turns into an informant, not a passive author. He serves as an informant and uh, he inspires the reader, be it an educator, um, an intellectual, a common layman. Uh, but that is the effect that I experienced when, when you have completed reading this book or at least sections of it. The experience that I had is that it inspires you to ask questions. And that to me is the ultimate goal in writing a book or a well-researched volume such as Breaking India. And that's the experience I had. So congratulations to Sri Manhotra for making such a one-of-a-kind contribution because it truly is <laughs> The author or the informant does not give us any prescriptions there. It is for us to decide. Just as my own guru when I was growing up, Swami Chinmayanandaji, I used to attend his discourse and classes when I was very young and he used to say, I remember from one of his discourses, the pointer never touches the point and he shows you the direction and then you do the journey. And that truly is the purpose of a book, and I think it has served its purpose. Now, what it led me to is a question, the fundamental question of this book is, but why? The author has described in detail, in such immense detail, a certain scenario. It is well investigated, and he has more than satisfied the conditions, criteria, or scrutiny of social scientists. That, by the way, that happens to be my background. That's my graduate training is in sociology and anthropology, study of cultures and societies. Um, it has um, more than satisfied the, the criteria of social scientists. It is very well researched, investigated. Um, and so here is the question, why this reality. What is the purpose that there's been a lot of evangelical activities in India? Yes, and that seems to be producing a certain effect. The fracturing of India, the disintegration of India. Okay, we started off with that statement. It's a threat to India's integrity. Yes, it is obviously, or at least it has the potential to disintegrate. Now, why do some forces want to disintegrate India? That is the question. 
religion is that the ultimate? Is that the ultimate goal to offer for free what they call salvation? Or harvesting of souls, whatever those categories they use. But what is the ultimate here? Or is there an ulterior motive? Well, I have to tell you that perhaps I should introduce myself to you. Um, but beyond my name, I'm known to some of you and I'm not known to many of you. Uh, I'm Sharat Menon and I do have another dubious reputation and that is I come from that one-of-a-kind state in the whole world, Kerala, which is God's own country. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't lived there, I can tell you one thing, that is the least Indian-like of all states. So, wearing a tie is not the only reason why I look quite an Indian today, it's because I'm from Kerala. <laughs> <laughs> What I would like to focus on here is, yes, uh, my own research in recent years, which has been in the area of sociology of globalization um, and globalizing religions. <clears throat> While I was conducting my research two, three years ago, um, I happened to accidentally um, watch an interview segment on one of Kerala channels, Asianet, um, about which I said about it, but that's a different thing. Um, the, the man who was interviewed was none other than the chair of management studies of the National Institute of Technology and IT in, in Calicut, Kerala. A brilliant intellectual, his name is Dr. Prabhagar Paleli. And while he was actually being interviewed on the terrorist attack in the Taj Mahal Hotel in Bombay, and uh, it was in that interview, which is truly an eye-opener, he said, that if you're talking about India being made a target by terrorists of from Burma, he said we were totally mistaken. India has been targeted more than any other nation in the world for longer than ever. Okay. This has been going on for a very long time, even before 1947. The question then is why? Well, we have to first of all look at the, the demography, and the potential that it holds. Where else have we found more than 350 million English knowing, I will not say English speaking, educated middle class. This is unprecedented in the entire history of humanity. That is the power. The Roman Empire didn't have it. Greeks didn't have it, the Persians didn't have it, the Chinese didn't have it, and the Guptas and the Mahdists didn't have it, but we now have it. I shouldn't say we, India has them. So that is something for India to, and Indians to consider. That it is unprecedented in the entire history of humanity to have that many of such an immense human resource pool part of one sovereign nation. That is unprecedented. So, why there is so much of missionary activities, why so much money is flowing into India right, through different agencies, I think, well, actually my theory is this, that religion is only the penultimate. Religion serves as a conduit for for the maintenance and the continuation of the Western economic hegemony. And the only way, the only way this can be ensured is by containing this immense pool of resource called India. That is the only way it can be done. It cannot be obviously conquered again. It is may become too smart to be conquered. So the best way to do it is to play with this idea of identities. And the question, the first question to me was, how has the identity of Hindus evolved? Well, that's a great question, and my answer to that is, if, he, if Hindus ever had an identity, that has evolved into zero. So that's what it has evolved into. And why? simply because we are mixing apples and oranges. 
In the context of religion, it's apples and oranges. You have two exclusivist IDs with a non-exclusivist. I have to tell you this. Whenever I teach sociology to American students, I refer to American books. They always teach. It's one of the most religious countries in the world. So I carry them wrong. It is the least religious country in the world simply because 80% of the people are not religious. We have some religious numerical minorities, and why? Because religion is nothing more, nothing less than an organized polity. It is for the purpose of controlling people. Whereas, someone who is born and raised in India's civilizational setting never had to worry about that. When I was born, I my parents did not take me to Guruvayu temple to be baptized. There's no such rule. Right? The temple did not collect 10% from my parents. You could go there when you felt like, if you had time, even if you never went to a temple, you would still live and die as a Hindu. So there is no control. And that's what we call freedom, isn't it? Well, it's good in a way, but the disadvantage is that in a globalized scenario, when Indians or Hindus have to compete with exclusivist bodies, then it's a losing game. Simply because this idea of true freedom that individual enjoys, which only, if you ask me, an Indian enjoys on the, this planet. Right? Freedom to think for oneself without being constrained societally, or politically, or militarily. Only Indian has enjoyed, experienced it. But that remains tentative because when you are competing for space with, or when you are forced into a competitive mode for space with exclusivist groups, then it is inevitable that at some point you run the risk of losing your own space. And for that reason, it is... Uh, for that, thank you. Uh, for that reason, it is important for so-called Hindus who take the identity to actually organize. And they can do so peacefully, non-violently, for the sake of protecting civilization. But are identities irrelevant? No, I do strongly disagree with Amartya Sen, who said that is reductionistic. It is confining oneself to a civilizational identity. No, identities are truly identities, and people do need that. That doesn't mean we are engaging in a reductionistic mode. If that was the case, then there is no need for the government of India to protect minorities, because that's an identity. <laughs> Why should 2.6 million, 2.6 crores or percent of India's population Christians have a protected identity while we turn around and ask 80 percent people, identities are useless, they're relevant. No, it cannot have that. Yes, identities are very important, but that doesn't mean it would make one intolerant or reductionist. No, it is an identity that we all can cherish and be proud of. There are many things that I'd like to allude to in the context of what the author has said, but in the interest of time, I would have to cut that down, but if you could grab me just maybe, I shouldn't say two, one and a half minutes, but that would be two. <laughs> Uh, coming from the state of Kerala, I have to tell you there have been many, many instances of these uh, sinister uh, or nefarious activities, uh, activities that are directly threatening India's integrity, and many of which could be constitutionally challenged by the religious majority, but for whatever reason it's not being done because it's one state where you have 56% population of Hindus and the rest somewhat equally divided 
and yet with 140 constituencies, you have 73 religious minority MLAs and 67 Hindus. So that says something about the political consciousness of the people. And why? Political consciousness is so weak, it is simply because it, that grain is in every true Indian, and that is, every Indian is on one's own trajectory. The vision has always been transcendental and not lateral. And this has, can be politically very dangerous, and this I think is the reason why politically or the political consciousness of the Hindu is not nearly as strong as that of a Christian or a Muslim, and they are not to be blamed. It's been very successful, proven to be successful. If a Hindu does not take pride, if he does, does not remind himself or herself of that civilizational identity, then that is not a healthy trend. So it's important for them to cultivate that consciousness. Identities are important. Sorry, Amartya Sen was dead wrong about it. Um, because there is a political leading to it. It's very obvious. Yes. Thank you very much.